I've noticed something here. When you've exhausted all the pathways, you actually let a little uh, leafy bit the end of the tree. There's actually an end to the tree. There's no more like uh, unfinished branches. So, all of this is like done for here. There's only two for each one. We don't have the other one for this section to get through here. And we have the one for here, though. So let's continue down this pathway where everyone met up. Uh, this one, everyone met up, back, followed Luca to the treehouse. Rolo and Luca did not get into a fight. They all became homies. They went to Luca's house the next day, found a secret entrance into like a basement area by pulling a teacup in the grandma's cabinet after Luca lockpicked it. How he knows that lockpick? I don't know, but he did. They snuck down, they found some stuff. They learned about some weird health issues going on in the town, some sort of disease going through that Luca's dad was researching because he was a doctor there. And there was a bunch of explosive barrels and stuff. And they found out that the grandma was sneaking people messages through the jam. So now we, and then the, Mr. Tolliver ended up at the house for some reason. No one knows why. And he came down while the kids were still in there. And Rolo tackled him. And they tied him up. With Chill, he left and locked him down there. So, let's see what the other option is. Good cop, hard cop. They'd run the classic good cop, hard cop interrogation. Rollo brandished a steely gaze. I've got this. Read about it a hundred times. Rollo swaggered past the chair which propped up the slumping Hiram Tolliver. Without even looking at his captive, he began with a long, blustery drawl. Well, well, Mr. Tolliver. Mr. Tolliver remained motionless. Rollo spun around to face him. He'd clearly expected to rouse Mr. Tolliver with his booming voice. Mr. Tolliver? Beck and Luca gave each other an unsure glance. Rollo slammed his fist on the table. I said, Mr. Tolliver! He grabbed the table lamp and beamed it onto the unconscious face. Mr. Tolliver groaned and slowly lifted his head. He recoiled with a muddled, weary squint. And the world? The chair wobbled as he attempted to straighten up. Oh. Oh. Who's Mr. There? Tolliver could only make out rough shapes through the glaring light. With a gruff tone, Rollo hoped to both conceal his voice and intimidate. I'll be asking the questions here, punk. <laughs> Hold on, let's just calm down. Oh, I am calm. Calm as a carrot in dirt. As for you, looks like you're sweating. The doubtful expression on Beck and Luca's faces transformed into awe. We can do this my way, or... Well, let's just say I've never needed another way. Rollo, hitting his stride, was now channeling every detective trope his memory could recall. <laughs> He slammed the table again. Don't dance! What? I don't Mr. even- Mr. Tolliver's voice became desperate. He was nearly in tears. You've tied me down. How the could I dance? Dance with your mouth, punk. Spill the beads! What are you doing poking around this house? I'll be here to help you to burn. To make sure everything's ready. Oh, so you're in coots with Gran? Grand. Mr. Tolliver was in a daze, now more confused than ever. Gonna help her blow up the festival, eh? Blow up the festival? Good he lord! He shook his head, feeling more and more dizzy. 
No, no, you've got it all wrong. Where is she now? Did she head it to the source? Source? What's the source? It's His where... His voice faded to a whisper. The town began... Where it all began. What is Operation Spark Plug? With that, Mr. Tolliver passed out cold. Rolo swung around with a repentant grimace. Damn, Rolo. I think you went a little too hard on him. What do you say about the source? It's where the town began? We need more information. Yeah, but we'd better not push Mr. Tolliver any further. Is there anyone else you might know more? What about the History Museum? It just got set up for the festival. Nah, that tent was put up by the Valentines. Everything they do is just a bunch of fluff to glorify themselves. Is there anything more reliable? The library. If there's any information about this source thing, Kato can help us find it. Let's go get some answers. Kato! This is a dang nice library. Thanks, we work hard on it. Aren't you a little too adorable to be a librarian? Adorable. Oh, uh. Kato hung out here so much, eventually they gave him a set of keys. I just keep an eye on the place for Miss Novak sometimes. They got you working for free? It's quiet, I get all access to the books I can read. No more can a person want. Fair enough. What can I do for y'all? We need a favor. I already told you, Anne Lola. I can't put you on any higher the wait list for the next Hank Atomic. If you're here with more candy, I'll have you know I can't be bought. It's called a personal code of concerts. Actually, we're looking to do some research. Now you're speaking my language. What are you looking for? That's the thing. We sort of don't know. What do you got on the history of the town? Mm -mm. There's the country record archives. What's the nose? Births, deaths, newspaper clippings, stuff like that. Pretty boring writing. But they do go all the way back to when the town was founded. Great, we'll start here. Chapter 8 Six feet under, three towns over. The kids spent the rest of the afternoon combing through dusty piles of old county records, desperately searching for anything that could help them make sense of Mr. Tolliver's cryptic utterance. Luca tried to shake the thought of Grand's basement. But his focus wavered. Explosives. Messages hidden in jam. Dossiers on various town figures. And a corkboard threaded with photos. Gran was the only family he had left. He still couldn't bring himself to believe the worst. But the old map with the symbol of explosives in town square made that difficult. As the sun began to set, the kids were no closer to the truth. If I have to read any more records, my eyeballs are gonna pop. We have to keep digging. If I dig another word, I'm gonna end up with one of those asinine death records. Rolo Cotter lived a full and wonderful life. Until he read so much boring crud as brain ooze out of his ears. Rolo shut his book with an assertive nod. If you got a better idea, spit it out. You sound like my sister. Keep pushing your luck, pal. It won't be boring country records that kill you. And I'll put in, put you in the obituaries myself. Rollo muttered under his breath. Your country record. Really? That's the best you've got? When I'm done with you, you'll be the footnote in history. Just Beth like. Slammed her finger down on the open page before glancing down to read. Jay Hartford here. I love to see you try. Hey, hey, hey! We're all a little tired here. Let's just take a minute and... Something tickled the back of Luca's mind. Wait, what was that name back? In the obit? J. Hartford. In the Brookville Tribune. Eight years ago. That can't be right. What is it? J. Hartford? That's my grand's name. Juniper Hartford. Maybe there were two J. Hartfords? Mrs. Hartford is survived by her young daughter, E. Hartford. 
<gasps> My mom's name is Eleanor. Okay, this is getting creepy. If your grand is six feet under, three towns over. Then who am I living with? What? Okay, so either it's an imposter or his grandma is actually his mom. Um, his grandma's actually his mom because she got hit with the goop. I wonder if that's what happened. The question hung in the air. Alright, gang, I gotta close up for the night. Also, I don't know why the button changed to keyboard and mouse. Maybe it's because I clicked off and back on to the game. But I'm still using a controller. Beck rubbed her eyes. How late is it? Almost done. Oh crap, Paul's gonna kill me! I gotta go! Yeah, my parents will be worried sick. Okay, let's meet up as early as we can at the festival tomorrow. What are you gonna do about the unconscious man in your basement? I'll think of something. Luca's heart was pounding as he approached the house. I mean, why would he still be there? If he was lucky, Gran, or whoever it was, hadn't gotten back yet. And of course, there was Mr. Tolliver tied up and unconscious in the basement. Dealing with him would be the first order of business. Luca shook out his arms to calm his nerves before entering. You. Yeah. He held perfectly still, tempering his breath, and listened closely. She was asleep. His only hope was that she hadn't found Mr. Tolliver before dozing off. Oh my god. I feel like I shouldn't go investigate her, but what if it gives me a charm? <laughs> very, very quiet. Approach to Grant. Okay, there's nothing here. It's very weird that Nat didn't have, like, footsteps. Okay. She didn't even come back here and, like, notice this was, like, off. He's gone. Oh, no. Mr. Tolliver was nowhere to be seen. Maybe he woke up. Escaped from his findings and left without a trace. Or maybe Gran knew everything. What do I do? Luca's hungry stomach groaned. Not realizing it, he'd gone the entire day without eating. Okay, I can figure this out. Just need a little brain food. Luca rushed over to the pile of jam jars, unscrewed one, and shoveled a handful into his mouth. I'm afraid your jam delivery will be delayed. He flipped the lid to read the label. Mr. Nuncreed. <laughs> oh no! Oh no. Okay, now I can think. So if Grand knows we tied up Mr. Tolliver, I'm screwed. I feel like that's gonna be bad that he ate that. If he doesn't know, then I need to play it cool. I guess the only option is to go to bed and act as if nothing is wrong. Graham will think Mr. Tolliver finished what he was sent to do and left when he was done. Go sleep. Pretend nothing happened. Pretend. Let's pretend you went to sleep. And oh no! Graham? Okay. Stick to the plan. Go to bed? Play cool. 
As Luca climbed the final stair, the emotion of the day dragged heavily on him. Uh... With each consecutive step, his legs weakened. His stride began to falter. He tried to grab for the railing to steady himself. Just, just go back and sleep in the treehouse. Something was wrong. Come on, legs. Just a few more steps. Luca groaned oh, and tried to move. No! It was the jam! Oh, no! His limbs might as well have been bolted to the ground. Through numb lips, he mumbled just before falling asleep. Sweet boy. What did you get yourself into? Rest now and let me handle everything. Chapter 9 A Speech to End All Speeches Luca awoke to find himself face down in bed. He moaned into his pillow. Why would Gran drug him? Or rather, why was she trying to drug Mr. Nuncreed? That's a good question. Shaking the questions from his woozy head, Luca snapped back to the matter at hand. Maybe because he's in on it. He's in on it. He's part of the, the bad crew. The festival! Ew! Where have you been? I, uh... I can't put something into jam. Yeah, we know. Secret messages for secret conspirators. Not this one. The one intended for Mr. Nuncreed. Put me to sleep. Whoa ho ho. Slide double. So I. Think she's trying to remove him from the equation. He might be in danger. Have you found anything? I looked around but I haven't seen anything on. Your grand's nowhere to be found. Well, Mr. Benon Creed is just loafing around waiting for the speech. What speech? Mayor Gus just got up to the podium. Everyone is gathering at the stage. Let's get moving. Augustus Valentine nervously wiped his brow. Mm-hmm. It's saying, oh, God. Oh. Hello, Beacon Pines. I'm Augustus Valentine, your mayor, and I suppose you already know that. Uh, yes, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to recognize someone who couldn't be here today. This town wouldn't be where it is today without my father, Sharper Valentine. So I thought we could begin with a round of applause befitting such a great man. <laughs> yeah, and that's more than old Kaja deserved. Gus cleared his throat and awkwardly loosened his tie. Uh, right, or as William I... Kerr bounded on the stage with the energy of a preacher at a big tent revival. Gus Valentine, everyone! He gave Gus a hearty slap on the back and motioned him off the stage. Let's hear for our mayor. What a great turnout. Ah, oh, heck, I didn't prepare anything. But I suppose I could say a few words. It would be a shame to waste such a beautiful podium. Mr. Kerr pulled a thick stack of note cards out from his vest. Community, conviction, commitment. These are the things we celebrate at perennial harvest. For us, these are the pillars of the bridge to a better tomorrow. But I think I'm that of new pillar. Change. Mm. Change is a powerful thing. It's inexorable, unavoidable, and undeniable. Inexorable. <laughs> and I am dadgum thankful for it. Change is the reason we're all together today. It's hard for me to believe that it was only four years ago when fate brought me here. A simple business trip which brought me to a small town which could change my life forever. Mr. Kerr took a moment to survey the crowd. You know what? He wiped away a single tear. The second I set foot in Beacon Pine, something about this place had held me captive. You see, change represents opportunity. 
It represents potential. Those chains that help me recognize the potential of this place. See, the people of this town, despite suffering great loss, still held on to things that made them special. He thumped the podium to emphasize each word. Community conviction commitment. Change. Mr. Kerr nodded confidently, biting his lip. The crowd was silent, in rapt attention. Fate made a perfect match that day. Nothing is more important to y'all than community. Perennial Harvest is a community first and foremost. Mr. Kerr methodically made eye contact with each section of the crowd. The only way you made it through the fall harvest was an unshakable conviction. The conviction that a better tomorrow was just over the horizon. Perennial Harvest was founded on the conviction that we are that horizon. This festival is a symbol of our commitment to each other. His voice began to build to a crescendo. We now walk in hand in hand into a future we will shape together. And that's what change is all about. Grabbing a future by the scruff of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. I am tickled pink that we all will be making that choice together. How good is that? Just imagine what we can accomplish. Ah, shite. What was that? The crowd began to look around nervously. Don't worry, a little thunder isn't going to ruin this day. Everyone's from Mr. Kerr quickly flicked through his note cards. Where was I? Through all my travels, I have learned one true thing. One always keeps what they sow. We have all planted a lot of good in this town. So it is with a happy heart that I can pull He raised his hands up to the heavens. A harvest the wheat. Ooh. At that moment, a merciless wall of impossibly cold air ripped through the crowd, instantly freezing everyone and everything it touched. For a man like William Kerr, this was a fitting way for things to end. On a stage, with an entire town frozen in rapt attention for the rest of time. The end. There's that ice again! Whenever I think we're getting close, it comes along and ruins everything! I, yeah, I noticed that. Maybe we should just quit? Maybe you should just close the book, walk away, and never think of me again. No, it's all right. We, we still got chances. We still got things to no, do. No, I... I don't mean that. Of course you don't. We got a little closer this time. We just need to try again. Please. 